Good. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. Oh, that was good. For, uh, if you couldn't tell, I'm not Jewish and I'm taller. So I'm not, I'm not Pastor Bush tonight. Um, he is under the weather. And so he got a hold of me last night and said, hey. And well, really, he sounded like very hoarse. And so he had probably what I had going on the week before with the throat thing and the allergies. And so uh, we'll be sure to keep him in our prayers. Uh, so I'm filling in for him tonight. And allergies, allergies or whatever he has, it's, it's got him down for the count. Something. There we go. So uh, we'll keep him in our thoughts and prayers uh, tonight. So before we get started and I introduce what we're going to do this evening, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. So bow your heads, please. Father God, thank you for this wonderful church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you for just the ability to gather here to study your word, to grow in a real knowledge of you as we consider the text and uh, what you have for us there. God, I pray that you uh, be with me tonight as I speak and uh, talk about hermeneutics once more, and uh, that I am careful to give you all the praise and glory as I do so. Thank you for your son and for his sacrifice. In his, in his name I pray, amen. All right, so I tipped my hand a little bit uh, with what I just said, and I used the word hermeneutics. So there are some of you that are here that weren't here. Oh, we don't even have it on the screen. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, that would be helpful. It's like, everyone's like, what are we doing? Oh, come on. That was rough. Hey, Epson. All right. That's not a good word. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Okay, we'll kind of give it a minute. So I'll, as it's going up on the screen, I'll introduce it. So uh, a little over, I think it was a year ago, I gave my first talk on a Wednesday night at Southwood. And I was so nervous. Basically, I presented a paper, uh, or I wrote a paper for Chafer Seminary. And uh, Pastor Bush wanted to read it. So I gave him the paper, and he read it, and he said, and he met with me and said, oh, this is so great. You've got to present this at Southwood. And I was like, no. No, I was kidding. I'm kidding. But I, I was very nervous, and so I put the PowerPoint together, and, I, and it was an alleged contradiction in the text that I wrote about between uh, a specific word in Paul's writings, and also it can be found in the, the Epistle of James as well. And I started putting the PowerPoint together, and then it kind of snowballed from there, and the scope just continued getting bigger and bigger. And then finally, it snowballed to like, I got to talk about Bible interpretation to give some background so that we can work through it together. And so that's what I ended up doing. So I put this PowerPoint together, and over a year ago, we recorded it, and then lo and behold, none of the audio recorded. So I was just like talking, and no one could hear anything. So uh, when I learned that I was going to be filling in, I suggested to Pastor Bush, said, what if you get the year and a half later version of the previous talk that's more in depth and has more of my knowledge on the subject uh, this time around? And so that's what we're going to do tonight uh, is, this, is a little bit different variation of the same talk. I've got some uh, other slides scattered in that I didn't have last time, so we're going to do that. If the projector will... It, it, it definitely is, but let's try again. When in doubt, unplug and replug, right? Let's see. We'll come up here, hopefully. If I had a PC, it would work. Probably. <laughs> All right. Technical difficulties here. Still nothing? I think this happened the first time around, too. Yeah, well, or not the video. There we go. Yeah, yeah. We'll just spice them together, and it'll be great. <laughs> oh, we've got some movement. Hey. Slow clap. Thank you. Stephanie does a slow clap for Mike Spence and is a technical inability. Oh, good. Yeah, not for me, for them. So thank you. So. So here we go. So the, the, entitled, the title of this talk is Words, Hermeneutics, and the Three Rules of Real Estate. 
And that's going to sound familiar to some of you that were here, and we'll go into it again a little bit. So it's an introduction to hermeneutics, and specifically an alleged contradiction in Paul and James' writings concerning the word justified that we're going to look at tonight. So brief outline, we're going to talk about what this alleged contradiction is and what it means. We'll talk about the proper biblical hermeneutic, and we'll define that. Then section three will be so many words, and we'll go into that. The three rules of real estate will be explained, and all of us will be able to do real estate better. Just kidding. We'll get into that, and then we'll tie everything together, and then we'll talk about why the topic matters. But before we get into that, I have a brief story for you. And this also happened a little under a year ago, uh, whenever Paul Miles came. I don't know how many of you know who Paul Miles is. Raise your hand. Uh, so Paul Miles came to our church, one of our missionaries that we support. And uh, I had never met Paul before, and I was very new to Southwood. And so I came in and sat down, listened to the service, and then Pastor Bush had to skedaddle right afterwards. But Paul was here, and so on Pastor Bush's way out, he grabbed me literally and said, hey, this guy's my friend. Why don't, Mike, you take Paul to lunch? And I was like, all right, stranger I've never met before, let's go to lunch together. So we went to Yokozuna, and we had some food, and so I was just talking with Paul Miles, and at that point in time, I was in a hermeneutics class, a Bible interpretation class at seminary. And so I asked Paul this question. I said, Paul, of all of the hermeneutics lessons that you've had and all the instructors and people that have taught you hermeneutics, who is the most influential hermeneutics professor that you've ever been taught by? And he considered for a minute. And if you've heard Paul talk, he goes, well, I think I have to give that some thought. because That's how Paul talks. And he said, it used to be so-and-so, but now that's number three on the list. I'm like, really? Number three on the list? Who are number one and number two? And he said, my mom and dad. And I thought that was interesting. So I asked him to elaborate. And I'm like, can you please tell me what credentials your mom and dad have that they can teach you Bible interpretation? And he explained to me something that I'll never forget. He explained to me that his parents, having the role of parent, were instrumental in spending his entire childhood working on communicating with language their intent in a way that he would understand them. And that's really the basis of Bible interpretation, is language. We have the revelation of God, do we not? Right? Everyone's got a copy of it in their laps, hopefully, right? And so we have the written word of God. And it's amazing to me that God chose to communicate to mankind about himself through language. That's fascinating to me. And so, but one of the things that we know about language is language can be misconstrued, but the original intent of language is to be clearly understood. And that's a very important concept that I want us to remember as we go through this. So let's get into what the alleged contradiction is, and it's going to really hone in around a word. And so it is a contradiction between alleged, that is, Contradiction between Paul and James, contradicting one another in their teachings. Paul teaches that a person is justified by faith alone, but James teaches that you can be justified by your works and not by faith alone. And the words on the page in the Bible read exactly that way. And so at face value, you're like, wait a second, what's going on? These two teachers that are also both inspired by the Holy Spirit when they're writing are contradicting one another doctrinally. So we have this issue that we have to deal with here. So I'm gonna show you in the text what I'm talking about. And we'll, and we'll start to see come into view very quickly that there might be a little bit of an interpretive issue that we have to work through together tonight. So let's look at Romans 4.2. You don't have to turn there, but it's on the screen. So for if Abraham was justified by his works, he has something to boast about, says Paul but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Quote, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also says, again in Romans, for we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from works. So now we see that Paul includes the word works and justified, and he makes a distinction between the two. He says works has nothing to do with what justifies a person. It's, it's faith alone. He carries on in Galatians and says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, 
but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So we see kind of Paul's point coming into view, do we not? Paul is really waxing on this faith alone. It has nothing to do with works concerning justification. Y'all following me so far? Now, we move to our other author, same Bible that we're reading. James, in the second chapter of his epistle, says this, was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? Now, at first glance, a lot of us should be going, that seems interesting and odd. That seems to be a direct contradiction to what Paul taught. He goes on and says, in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? So again, we see his use of justification here. Seems to be contradicting Paul. And then he concludes and really drives it home and says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Wow. So that's kind of his concluding remark there. And that is really opposed to what Paul is teaching. So when we're studying the Bible and we're looking into this, how do we harmonize the text? And it kind of poses a little bit of an issue. But if we approach the text, with a proper Bible interpretive method, this clears up pretty quickly. And we're gonna go through how we formulate that, which method of approaching the text is correct, and so on and so forth. So, how do we deal with it? How do we deal with this? Well, the answer is we learn to utilize the proper hermeneutical approach to the text. And we'll define hermeneutics here on the next slide. And this next question is very interesting, and I'm going to get a show of hands here. How many of us have ever in our lives, and maybe not, but how many of us have ever been in a Bible study or in some type of small group where we're in a little circle in chairs or in someone's living room, and someone will float a scripture out into the middle of the group and be like, let's talk about what this Bible verse means to me. What does it mean to you? How many of you have heard that before? What does it mean to me? Right? And then someone will say, well, I think that it means this. And they'll approach the text and they'll give an explanation of what they think that that text means. And then someone across the room that's sipping their coffee will be like, I disagree. And they'll give a different approach. And then, and then the really, and this is, this is why I love, the really new Christian friend that you invited that has no idea what's going on in the room is sitting there being like, I'm really confused, right? Because they don't know what's going on at all because it seems like you can have multiple interpretations of the Bible and either of them can be right. So that poses a really interesting problem. And it confuses a lot of people. And I'll be one of the first to raise my hand and say that that's really, I've been in that situation before myself. And I've been the person in the group wondering which person is right. These two individuals can't seem to agree on what that Bible verse means. So, That sent me kind of on a little bit of a trek to find out, well, how do we know what the text means? There's got to be a way to look at it and approach it that we can can know for sure and be certain that it's the proper way to interpret. And so we're going to take a little trip through some church history. Because when we're trying to talk about the proper method of interpretation, I would wager that we should start with the source, Jesus Christ himself, right? He is the word in the flesh, the incarnate God. When he speaks, he speaks what God says. Follow me? I I hope we all agree on that, right? And then we have the written version of that. The word is living, right? It's alive. It speaks to us. Uh, The writer of Hebrews tells us that in those days, God spoke in audible voice, and then through the prophets, and now through his son. And now we have the text, and it's canonized. So we have that. And if we can go back to the source, to Jesus Christ, and look at his disciples, the apostles, and their students, and look at the record of church history, and pay attention to how those students in the first century were learning from the very ones that walked with Christ himself, we could probably get a pretty good method of how we should look at the Bible too. And we're going to look into that. So before we do that, let's define hermeneutics. So, 
This guy on the left. How many of you have seen him before? His name is Hermes. And in Greek mythology, Hermes is a demigod. And his job, basically, you got his little wings on his feet here. His job is to uh, communicate on behalf of higher gods. Okay? So on the right here, we've got Zeus. There's his lightning bolt that looks like he's holding some grass. Uh, so there's Zeus. And so Hermes' role was really to communicate the intent and the messages of Zeus to the people. Uh, Hermes is also seen depicted with a messenger bag that he carries while he's off with a message. And so Hermes' job really is to communicate and carry a message, to relay a message. Does everyone follow me? So we take his name and we get the word hermeneutics because when we do Bible interpretation, what we're doing is exercising a method or an approach where we are trying to figure out what God's intent is in his word and accurately communicate that. So we see how there's a parallel kind of with these two words here, uh, with Hermes and hermeneutics. Do you guys see that? So that's where the term comes from, and that's why we get, uh, why we call it the hermeneutical method. So a little bit more history for you. There are two main hermeneutical schools of thought, and every one of us in the room knows of both of them, I guarantee it, or at least we've heard of them. So we have two schools that were uh, functioning in the early church, and one of them was the school at Antioch, specifically Syrian Antioch. And this was the headquarters of the church at that time. It moved across the coast of the Mediterranean over time. And at this point in time, it was the headquarters of the church. And there was a lot of apostolic authority there. The apostles were involved in the school at Antioch, and what they were involved in was the proper teaching of the text, students. And so there were students there. Kind of think of like a, a early, early first century seminary, if you will, and, and further than that into history as well. So they've got students running around, they're teachers, and those teachers that were pivotal in setting up that school, a lot of them were the apostles themselves that walked with the word incarnate, okay? There was another school, though, and it's the school of Alexandria. How many of you have heard of the library at Alexandria? Raise your hand. Yeah, lots of knowledge there, but specifically lots of philosophy happening at the school of Alexandria. And so here they are on a map. And so we have Antioch over here and Alexandria and northern Egypt over here. And so these two schools really had a very fundamental, fundamentally different way of approaching the text. At Antioch, they taught that when you read the text of the Bible, you should take it at face value as its plain meaning suggests. So if the Bible says this and it makes common sense, seek no other sense, lest it become nonsense, right? And Alexandria, with the philosophical approach to interpretation, they really sought higher knowledge. How many of you have heard of Plato or Socrates, right? Or Aristotle, okay? These are prominent figures in history that really were instrumental in kind of allegorization and philosophy of thought. They really enjoyed thinking a lot. But the problem with that is if you try and do thinking on the purpose of why we're here as people or what the role of mankind is in human history, apart from the creator, you arrive at spurious conclusions. Would you agree? You got some problems if you're trying to find the meaning of life apart from God. So a lot of philosophers were just like, what is the meaning of life? And it's like, well, you're trying to find it without God. So that's a problem. So there were some issues in Alexandria, but they really enjoyed thinking. And so at Antioch, I'll go back up to here. At Antioch, we had a specific way that students were taught. But at Alexandria, regarding the Bible, they took the text, didn't take it at face value, but allegorized it. And all I'm trying to communicate with that allegorization term there is that the philosophers at Alexandria read the text and go, it couldn't simply mean that. There is a higher, deeper knowledge behind what it says. And I'll give you an example. So here's one example just of allegorization. There is an early, uh, a, a guy named by the, by the name of Philo. He was a Jewish 
uh, writer and scholar. Shortly before the time of Christ, he wrote and allegorized some aspects of Genesis, okay? So specifically, there's a part of Genesis that describes four rivers coming out of the Garden of Eden, and then the text gives its names. So they are called the Euphrates, the Tigris, the Gihon, and the Pishon, okay? So the text says there are four rivers flowing out of Eden, and here are the names. But Philo said, no, 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 no. When we read that, those aren't literal rivers. What those rivers mean are the four parts of the, uh, the four virtues and four parts of the human soul. That's what those rivers mean. And everyone goes, ooh, tell us more about your, your super mystical understanding of Genesis, right? And everyone leans in in pursuit of higher knowledge because higher knowledge inflates ego. And so Philo was allegorizing Genesis, not taking it at face value. And so we hear a little bit from Bernard Ram about Philo. The outstanding Jewish allegorist was Philo. He was a thoroughly convinced Jew. To him, the scriptures, primarily the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Old Testament version, were superior to Plato and Greek philosophers. So he admits that the text of the scripture is superior to philosophy. That's a good start. But uh uh-oh, yet he had a great fondness for Greek philosophy, especially Plato and Pythagoras, by a most elaborate system of allegorizing. He was able to reconcile for himself his loyalty to his Hebrew faith and his love for Greek philosophy. So we had a merger going on. So we have a, well, I can take this and allegorize it. It doesn't really mean what it says. But over here, it definitely means what it says. And that's problematic because that's super subjective. Who decides where the allegoration stops and starts and where the literal interpretation ends and begins? It's subjective. That's problematic. But how many of us know of people that exercise this all the time? Um, it's, it's mainstream these days, very mainstream. Here's Origen in his works on Adam. He's quoted as saying this, who is so silly as to believe that God, after the manner of a farmer, planted a paradise eastward in Eden and set in it a visible and palpable tree of life of such a sort that anyone who tasted its fruit with his bodily teeth, would gain life. And again, that one could partake of good and evil by masticating the fruit taken from the tree of that name. Who is so silly as to believe that? But I, for one, am offended because I I do believe that. And we believe that in Southwood Bible. And it's really simple because that's what God says. And going back to my original kind of introductory story, I want to camp on language. Language is designed by God. Language was the instrument by which everything came into being. God spoke, and it was. And we read that in Genesis, and so when God is using language to communicate to mankind, it's meant to be understood. We take language classes and study Greek and Hebrew so that we can understand the original language. We take English classes to understand grammar. Language is meant to bring people together and to bridge the gap of misunderstanding. So it's alarming to me that there are certain individuals or certain teachers or certain denominations even that make it mainstream to look at language and look at a plain meaning of language and then to go, it can't mean what it says. I would like to say to that individual or those people that what you are doing is you are unraveling the fundamental purpose of language, which is to be understood. Would you all agree with that? And so we've got some issues there. So uh, I guess all of us in the room, we're just so silly (laughs) to believe that God is a farmer. Um, And by the way, if you went into Genesis, you would read that he planted. The text literally says that. God planted a garden in Eden. So, two terms for you to know and jot down. Uh, The first one is eisegesis. Everyone say eisegesis. And you're like, oh, he's engaging us from the pulpit. This is scary. So, eisegesis is inserting foreign external ideas and presuppositions into a text. Now, I've got highlighted there 
the word into because the preposition here, ice, means into in the Greek language. So eisegesis is when you're taking foreign ideas and putting them into the Bible. And I'll say this statement, and this will be kind of a takeaway, if you will, for you to jot down in your notepad or take in your phone or whatever. Uh, Language is meant to be clearly understood, but you can make the Bible and language mean whatever you want. How many of us have experienced that in our Bible study endeavors, right? Oh, well, Matthew 7 is such a scary verse because it tells you that there will be Christians that will plead with Jesus to let them into heaven, but he'll go, depart from me. I never knew you. Right? That's what it says. And when you argue with someone about that, they'll say, that's what it says. I've argued with people, and they'll say, how can you disagree with me? Do you not have eyes to see that those words are literally in the Bible? Friends, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. And as it turns out, words by themselves have no meaning. I'm going to say that one more time. Words by themselves have no meaning. I'm going to prove it later on. (laughs) So here's the next word here, exegesis. Everyone say exegesis. Exegesis has another preposition. It's the Greek preposition ek, meaning out of. Okay, so exegesis is the good word. Okay, that's the one that we want to be exercising at Southwood, where we're pulling things out from within the text as it sits and from what's there. We're not reading things in. We're looking, observing, analyzing the text on the page, and then pulling out meaning from that. So exegesis is good. Eisegesis is no good. So an example. Let's talk about interpretation. So Mike, you've talked a lot about words but you haven't gotten to really, how do we know which interpretive method is correct? Well, we're gonna try and make that direct link to Jesus, okay? So an example of the Antiochian or school of Antioch's hermeneutic is this. The apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved, the one resting his head on his chest, right, in the upper room, had a disciple by the name of Polycarp, okay? And Polycarp discipled a man, named, a man named Irenaeus. And Irenaeus wrote, and Polycarp also wrote, and we have their writings. So when we read Polycarp and Irenaeus' writings, we get a little bit of a clue into the way that they were taught Bible and how they learned to interpret. So in the Theocratic Kingdom, which is written by George N.H. Peters, he's got a quote by Irenaeus. And so I'm going to quote a I'm going to do a quote within a quote. So here we go. The literal grammatical interpretation of scriptures must be observed in order to obtain a correct understanding. The primitive church occupied this position. And Irenaeus gives us the general sentiment when he says of the Holy Scriptures, quote, that what the understanding can daily make use of what it can easily know is that which lies before our eyes, right? Written language. Then he says this, I love this, unambiguously and clearly in the Holy Writ. So when we read that there was four rivers flowing out of Eden, what does that mean? There are four, four rivers flowing out of Eden. You guys are excellent hermeneutical students. Good exegesis there. So what's the point here? Well, we can trace the proper hermeneutical method back to Antioch and primarily back to the apostles themselves. And that's a good authority to argue with. So when I'm having the argument with someone over Matthew chapter 7 or Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, right, and how that's about Israel and the end times and eschatology and all of that, and someone's arguing with me, I'll go, hey, don't take it up with me. Take it up with the Apostle John. So I like to camp on that. But the more popular Alexandrian hermeneutic, unfortunately, won over in the end. And do you want to know how I know that? How many churches do you know of that are like Southwood? Right? Some of you are like, none. (laughs) Not many. And we hold to that Antiochian hermeneutic because we understand the purpose of language and the importance to take the Bible at face value because God is trying to communicate with us in a way that we can understand. 
So unfortunately, a lot of people are doing the allegorization thing, okay? An allegorization of the biblical text is, as a whole, is a method of interpretation that is just not faithful to these four words, the literal or plain, grammatical, contextual, historical interpretation of Scripture. Here's an illustration. You guys have seen this from last time, but I've got another slide this time. So we've seen this letter before, right? So I'm going to read it real quick because I can't read it on there because I don't have my glasses. All right. So it says, Dear Dr. Brown, I am the chairman of the 2016 Metropolitan Medical Conference that is being held this year in Miami, Florida on July 5th, 2016. I write to invite you to present your groundbreaking research on beta blockers with our conference participants and invited guests. A 30-minute discussion of your work, along with a 20-minute question and answer session, would add so much to the intellectual landscape of our annual medical conference. The Metropolitan Medical Association would be pleased to cover your travel and lodging expenses while you visit the conference, in addition to providing a per diem budget during your stay. Please reply with your answer as soon as you are able so that we may begin making arrangements. I encourage you to contact me with any questions or concerns in regards Dr. Michael Smith. Now, we read this and we recognize some things, do we not? You're like, I know where Florida is, right? I know where California is. I know what a university is. I know what the little DR period in front of a name means, right? Because why do we? Because we've got the context. We're living in it, right? We use language like this. How many of you have ever, got, ever gotten a per diem budget before? Okay. We know what these things are. We know how letters are formatted, right? We know addresses. We know where New York is. We know how dates are written, all of that. But if we imagine for a moment that this letter is sealed up, buried, and in the year 4,000, 2,000 years from now, someone digs it up and reads it, how would they go about interpreting that? Interesting question, right? What, and don't miss this, what method would they use and where would they start? Here's what they're going to do. They're going to start making observations, right? They're going to consider what's there. Would it be fair to say that it would be a kind of a poor approach to just jump in and start making conclusions? That's probably not a good approach, right? Because in the year 4,000, there's no guarantee that universities are going to be the same. Where is it? It's somewhere up here. Uh, there we go. University of California. What if the University of California isn't a thing? What if it's no longer a thing next year, right? And then 2,000 years from now, it's no longer here. And you go, that seems a little bit far-fetched. But my question for you is this. Is the School of Antioch still here? What about the School of Alexandria? To learn about those things, we pop open Encyclopedia Britannica, right? And we start trying to get some historical context to read about what those places were. We don't need that today, us at least, because we're aware, because we're living in the history right now, okay? So we would make some observations. Who is this Dr. Michael Smith guy, right? Who is Patricia Brown, right? So now we're paying attention to who is it written to, who is writing, making observations, noting locations, and then some interesting things, like what's the University of California? I'm not sure I would want to go there. Uh, what's the Metropolitan Conference? What's this number in front of it? Uh, where's Miami, Florida? What's a beta blocker? I don't know what that is. A question and answer session? Interesting. Right? We're going to have one later, hopefully. Uh, cover your travel. Does that mean like with a blanket or what? I don't know what it means. Like cover it with like spray foam? I don't know. Per diem budget, expenses, what's the DR period in front of the name? These are things that we would observe and ask about, right? More than likely. So when we start doing a method of interpretation, we start with observations. What is there? So I'm going to do my best to try and get through this. So here's another one. I'm going to read part of it, and I'm just going to jump ahead, okay? So here's, a, here's a, an out-of-context section for you, and I'm going to read it out loud. Dear Daddy, I hope you are not alarmed. 
You should not be unless you know that there is one of the, uh, and excuse me, unless you know where one of the Zeps went. Interesting. I have heard that it raided London up the Strand and caused heavy casualties. But this I know because I saw, and so did everyone else in the house. Here's my story. I heard the clock strike 11 o'clock. I was in bed and just going to sleep. Between 2 o'clock and 2.30 o'clock, Lily, the servant, woke Miss Willie and told her she could hear the... And all of us in the room were like, what is happening? But we're starting to put some things together because we've got a little bit of context starting to form. Okay? What's going on, by the way, just based off of that so far? What's happening? Zeppelins, okay? A raid? Warfare is happening. There's guns, there's zeppelins, and there's people afraid. <laughs> and it's happening in the night, okay? Miss Willie woke Poolman and told him to wake me. He did so. Miss Willie helped Mrs. Willie down the stairs. We were all awake by now, and we have Miss Blair staying with us for the weekend. We saw flashes, and then we heard bangs and pops. Suddenly, a bright yellow light appeared and died down again. Oh, it's all right, said Pullman. It's only a star shell. Interesting. That light appeared again, and we, Miss Blair, Pullman, and I rushed to the window and looked out, and there, right above us, was the zap. So, I want to make an observation. The person writing this is making an assumption that the person they're writing to understands what a zep is. Is that an important observation to make? It's a, good, it's a good and important observation to make, right? And the rest goes on and on. So as we read through this, we start to formulate that there's warfare going on. And what you're doing is you're picking up on context clues. And you're starting to build a context. And you're starting to do that before you start to understand what's happening and what it means, okay? But what's interesting is that when we go to the Bible, we do the complete opposite. We jump to a word, we see the word salvation, and we go, oh, that means heaven or hell. And we do very little work to look at what the context is suggesting about the use of that word. Do we not? I mean, I'm guilty of it all the time. So we've gotta be good Bible students and good hermeneutic students and make sure that we're approaching the text properly. So other examples uh, of people allegorizing things uh, is the United States Constitution, <laughs> right? I'll get to that in a second. But the original intent, right? What is the context suggesting? What is the meaning of the original document, right? So ancient epics and narratives, we would have to do the hermeneutic approach with that. And one of the reasons I love uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is he's on the record saying that his job is to interpret the Constitution as it was written by the people who wrote it. He's a good hermeneutics student, right? But then we see on the other side, right? Now getting uber political here. Uh, we see on the other side, it's like, no, 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 it has different meaning for today. You mean that something can shift meaning? Interesting, very interesting. So the bottom line is, we're gonna take the Bible at face value, and so I use the word literal here. You could also, I think a better way of saying it is the word plain or common, okay? Unambiguous. So we're gonna take the Bible at face value, that's a typo, and it's been, I've had this PowerPoint for a year and didn't fix it, so I'm sorry. <laughs> at face value, as it is generally meant to be understood unless we are told otherwise to do so in the text. So if the speaker or writer like Paul in Galatians chapter four, those of you who have sat here, right? What does Paul say in chapter four at the end of the chapter? He says, I'm going to make an allegory, right? The free woman, or I'm sorry, the free woman is Sarah, right? And the bond woman is Hagar, right? And he starts to build an allegory of freedom and law, right? And he says he's going to do that, right? And Paul lets us in a little bit ahead of time that he's going to do that. So that's an example of the writer of the text telling us to take the text a little bit differently than plain meaning. Got it? So we're also going to take it grammatical. We're going to pay attention to the grammar, the words, the clauses, the phrases, the figures of speech and the grammatical structure of the scriptures. We need to take the context into account. 
the context of verses, passages, and whole books of the Bible. Keeping the main thing the main thing, and we're going to look at the historical background. We have to. We're not there. We weren't there in the first century when the New Testament was written, and we sure as heck weren't there whenever the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, was being written, right? Otherwise, we would really need to see a healthcare provider. So, so many words. Grammar matters, and words matter. So how do we tell the meaning of words using the Antiochian hermeneutic? Well, we look at the context in which the word sits. There you go. I, I told you I would get into it, and I did. So it turns out that there are some words that were meant to only have one meaning. Those words are called technical terms. However, how many of you have heard me say that before? A technical term is designed to have one meaning, but there are very few of them because as soon as a mainstream or a word gets mainstream with a different usage, it's no longer a technical term because now it has multiple usages. And that means that it can have multiple meanings depending upon its context. So a technical term example for you that used to be one is chemistry, the study of matter. But now when a guy gets with a girl, they have chemistry. So now it's got a different meaning. So which one, which usage of chemistry are you using, right? In the science classroom, you would use the more technical one, right? And on a date, you would use the other one. I, don't, I just don't think that we had chemistry. <laughs> I've never had that text before. Okay, so another example for you. Let's define the word run. I'm going for a run in the park, right? I'm just gonna go for a run. So how do we know what that means? Well, I'm gonna put one foot in front of the other and I'm going to go for a run, go for a jog. How about this, same word, I'm going to run to the store for groceries. Does that mean I'm gonna put my Skechers on and take off for Walmart? I hope not. Like, I can't imagine my mom being like, all right, we're going to go run to Walmart. I'm like, I cannot carry $100 of groceries and 80 bags on my way back. So I'm going to run to the store for groceries. I'm going to run some water for a bath. I'm thinking about running for public office. It was a good run while it lasted. Or I opted for Taco Bell and I got the runs. So the... The word changes, its meaning changes. And we could, and this is how, by the way, lexicons are formed in the Greek, is you look at the different usages of Greek words in the Bible, and then you pull together all the different usages, and you write the Greek word, and then here are its usages, one, two, three, four, five. Because we look at what context suggests meaning to the word, and then those are the usages. Same thing with the English dictionary. Same thing with the word run. If you looked at run in the dictionary, you'd have a whole lot of different usages, right? In spelling bees, they go, how do you spell this word? And they go, can you use it in a sentence? Why would they ask that? So that they can understand the sense of what the word means. You mean that words need context to have meaning? You bet. A biblical example. So we've got the word saved. The word saved and its various forms uh, specifically, it's noun and verb forms, sozo, soterios, and soteria, etc., is used several different ways in the scriptures. It's not a technical term. It's not a technical term. If it were a technical term, it would be used one way, right? In a theological, oh, I skipped one. In Matthew, there we go. In Matthew chapter 9, Verses 21 through 22, we can see a form of the word save. It's a verb form, sozo, in the original language used to convey salvation, which translated in English as made well from a sickness. So instead of jumping to conclusions when we see the word save and immediately going, oh, that means heaven or hell, right? We look at the context, and it's the context of the woman being healed from a blood sickness. In another sense, in a theological sense, the term is used to describe the more common one, salvation from eternal damnation, such as in Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Salvation from hell. Salvation from dying in your sin. Following me? And in Philippians 1.19, there's an occurrence of the term soteria, which is the same root, it's save, okay, the noun form, 
which is used to describe Paul's deliverance or salvation from prison, physical salvation. Christ also says that those that endure to the end, specifically the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period, they will be saved. So we see very clearly that save in the Bible is also not a technical term, just as much as the word run isn't, right? So we see that here. It's also true that the word justified is not a technical term. Various contexts can give various meanings to the word justified. So we looked at the beginning of the alleged contradiction between Paul and James, and they're using the same word, but what we're learning here tonight is that words have meaning by their context, and the context of James is very different from the context of Paul. So we're starting to see it clear up a little bit. Justified does not always have the same meaning with every usage and also in every context in which the word is employed. So what gives a word meaning? Context, context, context. And so a way to remember is the three rules of real estate, location, location, location. And in the same way, kind of to remember, the three rules of Bible study are context, context, context. It will help you out tremendously in your exegesis and exposition of Scripture. So let's look at justify. So when we want to understand justify in a specific place in the Bible, before we even go there, we've got to understand what the word justify means in the Bible, right? So we do what's called a word study, where we go through the text of Scripture, okay, and we look for the root word of the term justify or different variations of it, because the Greek is a conjugated language that is different from English, and so you'll see the root justify, but it looks a little different in different contexts, but it's the same general sense. So we look for the term justify everywhere we can find it in the Greek. And then we start to pay attention to the context and the way that that word is used in the context. And from there, we can kind of get a sense of what justify means all over the place in the Bible. So, the word justify, the verb form, dikaiao, okay, it shows up in a lot of different places. And so, it's got, when you look in the Bible, at the different occurrences of this word, you'll find the different usages, and we call those senses of the word, okay? So run in one sense means to go for a jog. In another sense, it means to loose water from the tap, right? In another sense, it means a really bad time in the bathroom, okay? So different senses of the, of the word run, okay? Yeah, I had to put that in. I'm sorry. Sorry, not sorry. So we've got different senses of justify as well. And so we look here and we see it says to pronounce righteous, to declare righteous, put right with, show to be right. Then we've got like a more legal term, to acquit, to set free. And you're like, I thought that this only had one meaning. No, because words have different contexts and they have meaning by their context. Okay, so justify has different senses because it appears in different places. So we just got to look at where they appear. So you see a bunch of green up here. So what I did was I went through the New Testament and I looked up every occurrence I could find of the word justify. And I started to look at the context surrounding the words and categorize the word meanings. Like which, how, are, how many different categories and ways is this word being used? So we've got some examples up here. It says in Matthew, for by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Okay, interesting. And we read on, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And then he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. So as we read through here, we, we start to see that the word justify is used to describe vindication or to show oneself as being right before mankind, right by their actions, right? When I turned this paper in to Dr. Mike Stallard, who I talked about on Sunday, 
he put a little comment at the end of my paper. And he said, by the way that you wrote this paper, I would say you're very justified in your reasoning. And, I, and, and he just wanted to drive the point home because there's different usages. And so we see that one of the usages in the Bible here is vindicate, to show or to prove to be right, reasonable or justified. If you look through here, do, we, do any of us see any usages that suggest like justification before God? concerning eternal life or eternal damnation? No, it's interesting. We don't see that here, hence why they're all green. But in other places, you see it used differently. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That's talking about a person being right with God positionally. Same word, different meaning. Okay? And then here's one that we've got highlighted. For Abraham was justified by works. I'm sorry, if, if Abraham was, he has something to boast about, but not, notice this, before God. So we've got two things going on. Justification before mankind and justification before God. I really want you to hone in on that, okay? So here they are juxtaposed together, the two usages I want to hone in on. And so we've got justification before God, and then really the alleged contradiction in James. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac? And my question for you is that did the offering of Isaac make Abraham righteous positionally? What do y'all think? Thumbs up for yes. For those on YouTube, no one is buying it. All right, thumbs down for no. Everyone's saying no, okay? No. Abraham is definitely not justified before God for doing some work. We learn very clearly in the text that things that you do apart from faith do not make you right positionally with God. But what we do learn is that certain things that we do can certainly vindicate us before observers of our fellow man. Let me ask you a quick question. How, did you, how do you know that Abraham showed faith towards God? How do you know that? You read it. What specifically did you read? That, but specifically what I'm talking about is how do we know that Abraham had faith? How do you know that? Well, you read it, sure. But I would wager that we see Abraham had faith by looking at examples of him showing it. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? When we talk about people showing awesome faith, we go to the passage where he offered up Isaac. My question for you is this, would we know that Abraham had that faith and, and, and trusted God tangibly for mankind if we didn't have that account to read about? My point is this, he did something that showed before mankind that he was righteous and trusting God. Interesting, right? So we see the two different usages here. So carrying it on further, um, the big issue with James chapter 2 is it seems to contradict Paul in the meeting, but we've learned that it doesn't. Okay, And I'll get into that a little bit more here. But some people have taken so much issue with this, for example, Martin Luther, that he took James because he couldn't, he just hated reading that there was this guy in the Bible that wrote that you could be right before God positionally. Works, And so he took James and he moved it to the back of the Bible, called it an epistle of straw, and it's in the back of the Lutheran Bible. So that's the way that he treated James. But if, we, but if he did careful exegesis, he would see that James and Paul are talking about two very different things. So what the issue that we're dealing with here is a term called illegitimate totality transfer. Okay, illegitimate totality transfer. And all that fancy word means is that you take a meaning from one context and you pull it out and then you apply it to another context for the meaning from another context to supersede one that you're looking at. And that's a problem because that's not the same text. Y'all following me a little bit? So that just doesn't work. 
So a word's context gives it meaning, and a meaning cannot be indefinitely transferred to a foreign context of choice. You just can't do that in Bible study. So now back to the James and Paul and tying everything together. The issue at hand with regards to the alleged contradiction is not so much a biblical disharmony issue as much as it is a biblical interpretation and hermeneutical issue. You can make the Bible say whatever you want to say. If you approach it without and without a hermeneutic that's accurate. Because we look at words, grammar, context, history, all of those things we look at to learn what the author's intent is. What is James trying to communicate? What is Paul trying to communicate? So let's answer those questions. (laughs) So Paul's primary usage, he uses the term to refer to the act of God justifying an individual positionally of Christ's work on the cross. Don't follow that? So just being acquitted for one sin, you're justified. Every one of us that have trusted in Christ and his work on the cross and applied his work to our lives, we are justified. You know what the text tells you? You're clothed in his righteousness. I'd say that's pretty justified, wouldn't you? So we understand that we're not made right with God based on anything that we do, but on what Christ did for us. We're learning a lot about this in our crucifixion study, right? And the, the leading up to the cross. And we've looked at the usages there, but James uses it differently. Primarily, he uses it to refer to one's lack of actions. Oh, I, I misread that. Lack of actions and faith are both useless to God and how they do not justify a person before their fellow man. Now, what does that mean? What am I getting at here? Essentially, James is saying that if you say you have daily faith, you trust God with your finances, you trust God with your path for your life, right? You trust God with that family member that just won't come to faith, right? And you're saying that you trust God in those ways. Are we talking heaven and hell in that context? Not at all. We're talking about daily life as a believer, right? But if we say we have faith in that way, if we say we're trusting God, but we don't have the works to back it up, right? Abraham says, oh, I trust, I trust you, God, with my son. And then he never went up to Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. What would we say about Abraham? He wasn't justified in saying that he trusted God. Why? He wasn't willing to go do what God asked. See what I mean there? So James is trying to communicate something very different. And I'm not going to get too much into this because I'm running out of time. But that's okay because after Matthew, we're doing James. (laughs) So I'm not going to steal the thunder of Pastor Bush there because he's not going to let me do it. So he's going to do it himself. So James is using the term as vindicated. Really, the root of the issue is this. Paul is dealing with justification before God. James is dealing with the issue of being justified before man by your actions. Two very different contexts using the same word. But we learned that words get their meaning from their context. So the the alleged contradiction starts to dissolve and it starts to get harmonized. So driving the point home, we already did that, so I'm going to skip it. So why does it matter? how we approach the Bible hermeneutically. Well, I hope that you've caught on to the fact that it does matter because you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. And I know several people throughout my life that have done so, including myself. So we employ a proper hermeneutic to understand how to interpret the original intent of the text in which we're reading. And as a result of employing a proper hermeneutic, We're no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We don't have to be the guy or the gal in the small group where everyone's floating their ideas and have no idea what God means. We don't have to be that person because we can look at the text and arrive at really sound conclusions by looking at it with the proper approach. What is the original intent? 
Am I looking at the words? Am I looking at the context? What does the history suggest? What does the grammar suggest? That's really important in 1 John 1, 9, right? And as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth, the truth. In love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head. So a couple quick other hermeneutical thoughts. So a contextual progression for interpretation. Let's say that we're going to look into something in the book of Acts, for example. Okay? And we're looking at a specific word there. How do we know? And we, we want to get some other information on this word. How do we know what that word means? We're struggling to interpret it, right? The context in which it sits is not quite clear enough for us to arrive at a meaning. Well, there's a method that we can do. We can broaden the context a little bit, right? And try and find that same word in a broader context. Follow me? But then, oh no, we didn't find it there. So we could look for it in the same book, right? How does that same author in that same letter using that same word? And can other usages help me to understand that one that I'm trying to study? Y'all follow me? But if we don't find it there, it's like, oh, he doesn't use it. It's, it's like the word uh, contentment in Philippians. You'll only see it one time, right? So can I go find that in other books written by the same author? So we try and stick with the same author and see how he uses the term across books of the Bible. An example of this would be the word light and darkness that John uses in 1 John. His gospel is very helpful in understanding the way he uses those words in his epistle. Follow me? And then if we can't find it in the same author's books and other books, we can use the same testament of Scripture. Where can I find it across authors in the same New Testament? And so on and so forth. Where can I find it in the Greek translation of the Old Testament? To help get a more broad understanding of the usages of the term. So that's kind of a progression that we can use to super sleuth our way through the text and arrive at some conclusions and do some observations. So I have here observations is first. We look at what's there. And we analyze what's there. And then we ask one of my favorite things ever, what are the implications of that observation? Right? What, is that, what are the implications there? What does that imply? What's implied there? And then we make some conclusions based off those observations and analysis. So it all comes back down to this, looking at it, what is in the text? That's a great question to ask. Right? So in closing... Why is this important? Why, why am I waxing on this so much? Well, every one of you, whether you like it or not, are doing some type of hermeneutic. You're taking some type of presupposition or not, and you're employing it in your Bible study. And what I'm trying to show you is that at Southwood, what we've got to really do and have the power to do of ourselves is to really pay attention to what's there and how we're approaching the text. We're reading other people's mail. So as we look at other people's mail, our, our goal is to look at what's the intent of the writing and what was the original meaning of that text. And if we do that and we arrive at that single meaning, as Pastor Bush would say, right, we can figure out what it means. And from there, the applications can be endless. But what we don't do is say that that Bible verse has multiple different meanings. Nah. Paul didn't have multiple meanings when he wrote, neither did James. They had one thing they were trying to communicate with the plain use of language, right? So we've got to be really careful in the way that we approach the text. So it's very important because our theology is built off of a proper hermeneutic or your bad theology can be built off of an improper hermeneutic. So it's very, very important. So um, I have a slide here for Q&A. But it is 8.04. So what I'm going to say is, is that you are welcome to leave because you're no longer on mic time.
as Kevin would say, right? But if you do have questions for me, I am happy to take them afterwards uh, after we go, uh, go off of being live and I shut the mic off. So uh, feel free to come up and ask me whatever you want or stay seated and I'll just yell at you. So, but before I yell at you, let's go to the Lord in prayer. So bow your heads with me. Father God, thank you for uh, this awesome church and these awesome people that came out tonight to learn some hermeneutics. And Lord, they didn't even know what they were walking into. They expected our Jewish leader to be in the pulpit, and he was not. So Lord, we want to lift him up right now. We know he's under the weather. Um, we're so thankful for him. So Lord, I pray that you give him quick healing and that you help him to feel better and help him to get rest and that you're with him in that time because uh, we're so thankful that he's leading us at this church and that he's also teaching me to help lead as well. So we pray for Pastor Eric Bush. Um, I also pray for all these wonderful people that have come out tonight, Lord. Just, I know that uh, across the room, everyone's in some unique circumstance where they've got something going on in their lives that uh, is maybe complicated or something's going on that's hard to deal with. Uh, there might be lots of joys to share and to relish in. So whatever anyone's dealing with, Lord, I pray that those that are in hard times, that you would draw near to them as you say that you are in Philippians chapter four, that you are near, Lord. And so place your hand on their lives. And for those that are experiencing joy, I, I, I'm joyful with them, Lord. And thank you for your son. Uh, without his sacrifice, we would not be where we're at. We wouldn't have his righteousness and we wouldn't be able to have a relationship with you. So we're most thankful for Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray, amen.